Hello, and welcome to the eTech Podcast with me, your host, Ryan Morn. I have been involved in the development of electrified vehicles and machines since 2005 as an engineer and a business leader. This podcast is the product of my passion for electric and autonomous vehicle technology. I'm here to share knowledge from some of the world's leading experts, as well as my own insights. Join me as we accelerate the transition to cleaner, safer and smarter vehicles and grow the industry around the world. Today is a bit of an interesting podcast. So we are officially uh, into coronavirus territory now. Um, So the bad thing about that, it means that I am not in the office with all my usual equipment. I am doing this from home. So I do apologize if there are any issues in terms of the sound quality or, uh, or background noises. So if a dog starts barking, um, you know what that is. Um, but the good news is, um, while we're away from the office, we're using this time to make loads of podcasts. So we've got lots of new episodes coming for you. And today's episode is one that has been in the offing for a long time. Um, various problems with diaries not aligning have made this uh, take many, many months to organize. But I'm really pleased to have with me today, Derez Echete from on Semiconductor. And uh, Derez is the global head of automotive business development with On. And he's based out in Phoenix, Arizona. So welcome, Derez. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for having me. And uh, could we just start off by uh, just doing a little bit of a dive into your personal background? Um, so I'm not sure if that's what you signed up for or not, but uh, just just talk me through who you are and how you came about doing to be doing what you are doing now. Sure, absolutely. Um, uh, so my background uh, starts, uh, you know, from growing up, uh, born and raised in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, in East Africa. Um, and uh, at the age of 17, I actually moved to the U.S. Uh, for higher education. So I went to school and colleges uh, in Indiana in the United States. Wow. Uh, that's where I uh, did my uh, bachelor's and master's in engineering. Um, and soon after, I, I found myself uh, back in my uh, passionate field of um, uh, automotive engineering, working for Delphi Technologies. Um, and after working at Delphi uh, for about uh, seven years, uh, I decided to uh, look into... Um, opportunities to learn more about business um, rather than focusing 100% on engineering. Um, so I went and got my MBA while still working at Delphi. Um, and that mix of technology and business um, opened up a door for um, moving down the value chain, uh, especially in the uh, electronic semiconductor area. And that's where I ended up uh, joining On Semiconductor as a marketing engineer. Okay. Uh, in 2011. And what? So just just going back to the start again, what was it that got you into engineering in the first place? Um, yeah. So it's more uh, looking into uh, you know the past, into my soul in a way. Uh, growing up, I've always been curious about how things worked. Right. Um, so I've always torn apart um, my father's radio or uh, my toys just to look inside uh, what was uh, happening inside. Ah, okay. So just a natural, naturally inquisitive mind. Yep, that's, that's exactly true. Yep. Brilliant. So, so, um, so then you, you, you uh, after you joined um, on uh, straight into more of a kind of commercial role in uh, within marketing, what does, what does that actually involve? So I, I don't, what, what does, what, what does that job involve? I have no idea. Yeah, and that's that's really the the other curiosity that I had when I first joined on Semi was, uh, you know, basically going from engineering to a business mindset. You know, what is marketing? And really, at the at the heart of it is understanding engineering problems and understanding solutions and putting it all together. Uh, so it's really finding a solution, but it's slightly different than an engineering solution. It's more a solution uh, that meets the market needs, uh, but also provides, uh, you know, solution at the right price or at the right time at the right uh, technology level. So that's what marketing is. Oh, wow. And um, 
that must be quite a challenging role in a in a company like On, where you've got such uh, cutting edge um, products. I mean, you 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 uh, as a business must look must be looking forward the the lead time of getting new technologies into production in in that sort of environment. You know, must must be a huge forward looking kind of uh, uh, responsibility. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, when you are dealing with uh, fast-paced uh, technology, uh, and considering automotive has always been a very slow in terms of adopting new technologies, and then it is accelerating in the last decade uh, so much uh, more than you know the previous decades, it puts you in a position where you have to adapt uh, to fast-moving technology and uh, uh, increasing demands. But the uh, the opportunity to work for an organization uh, such as Arms and Conductor that has uh, those tool sets, uh, you know, ready uh, to execute was really what uh, made me successful in my career. Oh wow! So just tell us then. So f- for people who don't know, um, tell us what it is that On Semiconductor does. Yeah, so on semiconductor, uh, today, uh, being about a $6 billion company, um, employing over 30,000, uh, people globally, uh, has a significant, uh, position in the market with, uh, you know, a number two, uh, power semiconductor supplier, uh, in, uh, many different positions, uh, number one in, in image sensors, uh, small signal, uh, diodes and transistors. So a very commendable, uh, position for a semiconductor supplier has uh, a depth of technology, manufacturing, uh, design, uh, innovation um, that suits uh, a wide range of applications and markets, uh, industrial, automotive, wireless, computing, and other areas. Um, so what we do is uh, we manufacture, uh, we design uh, semiconductors that fit many different applications and we try to uh, optimize uh, the, the value that you get out of those solutions through uh, our extensive manufacturing, uh, you know, vertical integration from uh, even the uh, substrates that go into the semiconductors all the way to the final product. Um, so that's really one of the uh, essence of the uh, on semiconductor infrastructure. Oh, wow. That's that's really interesting because it. I mean, I know that there are some. Um, companies in in the in the sort of semi space that they are more almost like virtual businesses where they subcontract out all of their manufacturing. But you're, so on on has it all of its own manufacturing right down to the substrate level. Correct. One of the things that we find value and we excel in is the uh, ability to have our extensive manufacturing footprint. Right. And uh, a couple of implications that you get out of it is you're able to control as much of the uh, quality and also the quantity or the the volume um, or the supply chain um, as much as possible. You still need some flexibility. So we do have a buffer of a network of, um, you know, uh, subcontractors. But especially when you look at automotive, having the automotive uh, devices come out of your own manufacturing infrastructure helps you uh, continuously optimize uh, your quality and improvements. Wow. And is that manufacturing spread all over the world or is it kind of concentrated in any one particular location? It really is uh, stretched uh, all over all over the globe. Uh, we have uh, in North America and Europe and in Asia. So it's really spread out uh, throughout uh, you know, the globe. And it really is also giving you a little bit of uh, business continuity or if you want to call it, uh, you know, risk mitigation plan as well. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. So then um, obviously where we find ourselves today uh, with the uh, the corona issues to one side, so working from home and, and, and all of that, but uh, pre, pre-corona, um, and, and actually post-corona, because as, uh, as we're many people were pointing out, you know, the world is still turning and uh, things will, will come back um, at some point. The, the automotive world, you know, was, was moving and it is moving in a huge way towards electrified powertrains. Um, 
And that seems to be a really good fit with what On does as a business. Um, um, how, how, how are you guys seeing that? Yeah, um, so for On Semiconductor, um, automotive is about 30% of our business. So, so it's still a very significant uh, investment and focus area for us to make sure that we have the right products and technology. And specifically uh, for automotive, we're focused in you know the two major trends, right? So there's, uh, let's call it autonomous or assisted vehicles, and then there's the uh, Electric vehicles, electrification of uh, elect- uh, the the vehicle infrastructure. Um, the one that I'm specifically involved in in the power solutions group, uh, the division that I represent, is the one that provides the most solutions for the electrification. And for that, really, we have to um, understand what electrification means. For us, electrification means uh, the increased efficiency that comes out of the transition from a pure internal combustion engine, which is ICE, sometimes referred to as an abbreviation, yeah. to uh, either it's a 48 volt or a high voltage, a, a hybrid, or yeah. a full electrified vehicle, all the way to even a fuel cell in the future. Yeah. So you're involved across the spectrum then of, um, of, of those different uh, XEV technologies? Correct. Absolutely. Right. And and what do you see as as being the uh, kind of most exciting um, area for you right at the moment? I think there is a lot of bright spots coming up. Um, the ones that are very exciting to us is um, while we're still working on the exact number of vehicles that will be electrified or the type of electrification that will come up, uh, whether it's forty eight volts or plug in. Really, at the essence of it, and this somebody will tell you if they've uh, driven a, a pure electric vehicle, is um, there is a combined satisfaction you get out of driving a, an electric vehicle with the uh, huge impact, a positive impact on the uh, uh, the global um, environment, as well as you know, really at the end of the the life cycle of that vehicle, uh, the savings in terms of the maintenance you get out of it, the, uh, the uh, overall cost savings of the life cycle of that vehicle. So all of those combined, I think it's going to be a very, very interesting um, you know, trend uh, moving into uh, electric, electrified vehicles in the future. And, and obviously, more electrified means electric motors and everywhere there's a an electric motor you've got uh, switching devices controlling the motor in some sort of inverter a var- variable speed drive type setup and i guess at the heart of those uh, devices are components like like your switching devices and is it, is it just are you guys doing kind of uh, integrated motor drives or are you supplying just the switching devices or are you you know what what kind of level are you going to is it discrete components modules more integrated systems yeah so uh today uh, our solutions and our focus is the uh, power devices um we are um supplying those to the uh, the suppliers that provide the complete solutions, the integrated d- drives. Um, but as you mentioned, the three things that really are the key in, in, a, uh, in a fully electrified vehicle, the battery, the motor, and the power switching devices, our focus is on those power switching devices. Our focus is to make sure that we continue to optimize those devices through the use of technology that we have today and the use of technology and innovation that we'll do tomorrow. And what I mean by those is, you know, how do we make sure that we um, we reduce or increase the efficiency of those power devices? We reduce the thermal uh, performance, uh, you know, it's uh, increasing the thermal performance, the reduce of the uh, um the inefficiency of the thermal performance of those devices, the cooling systems, and so on. So that's really our focus, and, and we stay in that uh, power semiconductor solution area. And, and is that moving more towards um, 
things like technologies like silicon carbide or uh, even further ga- the gallium nitride type um, devices or what, what's your particular technology area? Yeah, so today um, we have uh, all those technologies you just mentioned. We're one of the few companies in the world that have all three, uh, silicon carbide, mm-hmm. GAN, and IGBT technology. So we all we have all those three. Um, we've been working on IGBT technologies since uh, almost a decade now, um, and we do have those IGBT uh, solutions in either discrete or module form um, running electric vehicles on the streets today. Yeah. The focus is obviously there is a room for improvement in efficiency, and we see there's a play for um, silicon carbide and even gallium nitride, but uh, more so silicon carbide for high power applications, gallium nitride for uh, lower power applications and those el- electric vehicle ecosystems. Okay. And that's the reason that we're investing in both areas. So that would, is gallium nitride more in kind of sensing systems and that kind of thing, silicon carbide more for traction drives and, and high power drives? Is that a, a sort of fair understanding of that statement? Correct. Um, gallium nitride uh, has uh, a, a sweet spot, if you want to call it that, uh, in, uh, in a lower power application. Um, and in this case, you know, you will find gallium nitride in uh, DC-DC converters, for example, that run, uh, you know, in the 20 kilowatt max range. Okay. Um, and then you have, you know, gallium nitride in uh, laser drives for in autonomous vehicles, for example, which are uh, rated 100 volt uh, gallium nitride. So those those are the ones that we're focusing the gallium nitride solutions for. Right, right. And then silicon carbide in the rest. And do you just do you still see a place for IGBT technology in the future, or do you think that will eventually be entirely replaced with silicon carbide? No, in my opinion, I think uh, you know. Obviously, this is uh, nobody has a, a perfect view of how this is going to turn out. But IGBTs will continue to have a significant play in in power conversion. And, and, and specifically in EVs as well. We see that uh, a portion of the systems will migrate to uh, silicon carbide. There's even some vehicles today that uh, will utilize both uh, IGBTs and silicon carbide, IGBTs in one um, motor and then uh, silicon carbide in another motor in the same vehicle. Uh, and one motor is uh, potentially tuned for high torque applications while the other motor is uh, tuned for, um, you know, uh, maybe a, a, a longer range, uh, a, a less demanding drive. So one would be designed with an IGBT and the other designed with silicon carbide, as an example. Oh, okay. So in that, in that instance, then, are you continuing to develop IGBT devices as well as, uh, as the newer technology? So are you looking for ways to make IGBTs more efficient, or is that pretty much, is that done now? Is IGBTs as good as they'll ever get? No, I, uh, we're still working on the next generation, and then the generation after that, uh, different levels of the organization and, and technology development. Uh, the work is not uh, anywhere close to being done. Uh, oh. There's the next generations of IGBTs will be coming out soon, you'll see and uh, the one after that as well. So the work is continuing uh, to, to, uh, to improve upon the existing technologies. And just so I'm going to ask you this question a, a, a couple of times, but for, for an IGBT device, what are the kind of areas that um, people are working on to, to make a better IGBT? What's the, how, how do you go about doing that? So, uh, you know, obviously, um, in IGBT technology or any device that you have, um, there are multiple things that you can do to optimize the solution. But really optimizing it to the actual end application is where you get the most out of it. Uh, In terms of silicon, um, the one denominator is if you can optimize the design meaning that uh, the less area it takes for the same performance, uh, immediately you have a benefit. So uh, one is 
designing it with uh, you know the optimum uh, silicon area. Right. Uh, and that takes up uh, you know uh, the uh, silicon area out of the uh, equation. Um, the second one is adding features. Um, what are the features that you can add uh, to to drive it better, to drive it uh, more efficiently, and to achieve uh, additional functions that may be required? So there's many different areas that you can look at optimizing the, the design of the HVTs just to make sure that uh, you uh, you are maximizing uh, your solution and meeting the, the, the requirements, but also... Um, doing it so uh, without, uh, you know, um, over-designing it. Right. And and is the, the are the products that you supply into the market, do they tend to be, and this is specifically for IGBTs here, do they tend to be packaged modules or is it discrete or, or even a, a, some sort of lower level, you know, wire bond type devices? What, what, what are the, what kind of level is the product you're supplying into the market? So we, we have uh, we have uh, various types. Uh, we have uh, anywhere from uh, the discrete types to uh, the very high end, what we call our V-Track uh, set of modules, uh, which are able to drive close to 200 kilowatt uh, solutions with um, uh, a stack up system that we've designed. So in, in, in the way that we have put together our solution, we're trying to segment uh, the approach with achieving the lower power systems, either through a discrete solution or our gel filled solution, for example, and then uh, the higher power systems with our latest technology with a dual side cooling package, which is uh, not using uh, wire bonded, but also uh, using the, uh, the um, clip method uh, for higher performance applications. Right. And having the cooling in both sides of the package and making it stackable, so when you're using uh, in parallel, you can you can increase the the power levels and be able to drive 200 kilowatts or or uh, about that area uh, for higher power applications. Oh, so right. there's a wide range of solutions yeah, we're providing. And that because c- cooling tends to be one of the major challenges with IGBT devices. Um, so, so that the, the ability to take heat out of both sides must be um, must be really useful in terms of uh, ma- managing those components thermally in operation. Absolutely, cooling is is one of the uh, the big challenges of the the system, and the ability to have the the dual side cooling uh, allows you to be able to drive higher power with a uh, form factor that is as small as possible uh, with. Uh, the ability to have uh, the function in in, uh, in a smaller number of modules. Mm. So, so then, just look, thinking about silicon carbide, then and c- comparing back to IGBT for a silicon carbide, everyone knows. Oh well, I'm saying everyone, not everyone. A lot of people would know that silicon carbide is sort of. Um, and I'm making some air air quotes here, better than IGBT. And I know I'll probably get blasted for that later, but uh, let's say it's better in terms of, you know, there's the, there are less switching losses. You can switch at high frequencies as a result, less thermal um, issues with silicon carbide. So would you still apply a technology like dual-sided cooling to silicon carbide device or... Does moving to silicon carbide kind of get away the thermal management, or, or does it? Is it just that now we go to silicon carbide, we're going to drive everything to a whole other level of compactness and power density again? So we're actually we still have thermal challenges, but we've just got something that's even smaller again. What's the what's the what's the approach? Yes, uh, I agree with you. Uh, there's a lot of um, messages out there about uh, comparing silicon carbide and IGBTs, and it's really one that has to be taken very um, cautiously because it is very difficult to compare them uh, apple to apple, um, keeping everything constant. So when we look at silicon carbide, it has the right level of um, uh, you know, in- increased efficiency for the right application. Um, so when we talk about silicon carbide, it has to be designed at a system level as opposed to just a, a part-to-part comparison. 
yes, you will get a little bit of performance on the same part, on the same uh, set of uh, everything else around it. But really, the most use out of certain carbide that you get is through the overall system approach, designing the system for the circuit carbide as opposed to replacing just an IGBT with a circuit carbide and expecting all the benefits. Um, so that's really where we, we need to focus on, yeah. And when, when, you, when you say that, are you, are you going as far as like using higher speed motors and getting the cost benefit out of a, you know higher RPM, lower copper motor, um and you know smaller cooling system on the vehicle are you are you going at that level or do you mean at the kind of inverter level design it could be any of those and it really is this is why it's so open to really look at what other things that i can optimize in the system so i'll give you an example for example if we take an existing car that has uh, a certain uh power level uh and a certain battery size with an igbt system yeah. and you replace the IGBT power switching with a circuit carbide solution, a, a circuit carbide um, transistors, and you expect, for example, a 3% increase in efficiency uh, in a drive cycle, let's just assume, uh, and you take that and what you get out of that increased efficiency uh, is either a 3% uh, additional range or you can take out a 3% of the battery, uh, which saves you a significant amount of money considering batteries are, you know, between $100 to $150 of, uh, per kilowatt hour. Yeah. Um, and you get those savings immediately. So this is what I mean is what is your end goal? Are you uh, trying to have a vehicle that runs longer with the same amount of uh, battery? Or are you trying to save cost out of it so that you can sell at a, a cheaper a price uh, using a certain carbide uh, solution versus an IGBT. And this is just the tip of, uh, you know, the example of what you can do with certain carbide. So it needs to be taken at a system level. Yeah. And it, it's interesting in the in the market application because a lot of, well, I mean, silicon carbide devices are typically more expensive per kilowatt than the IGBT devices. And a lot of applications, people are using silicon carbide for high end high performance to you know smaller more power dense more lightweight parts but then you've got people like tesla who are using silicon carbide in uh effectively their their low low um i say low end there's nothing particularly low end about it but the i say that the, the normal vehicle in the model three they they seem to have used silicon carbide there to good effect to get some system level uh performance so the high performance product is used in the lower performance vehicle do, do you do you see a pattern, or do you think actually silicon could could break through into all sorts of applications, or or would you see it more as a high performance solution? It will it will continue to have um, a share of the markets, uh, but IGBTs will will also continue to to keep a share of the markets, uh, just because IGBTs are still um, a very well situated in terms of providing um, cost benefit performance. Uh, for what we need today, um, and slowly uh, the circuit carbide will take over some of the um, the high end solutions, uh, but it will be a while before IGBTs are completely replaced by circuit carbide. Okay, and in in the that's of traction drives in components like onboard chargers and DC DC converters, which we mentioned. There's some some quite big advantages in those parts themselves going to higher frequency switching because um, you can shrink down the magnetics and the the, the capacitance in in those in those products. So like a within within the device, quite some some good cost and weight savings by going to silicon carbide or gallium uh, nitride. Is is that? Is that something that you see in um, in those other components on the vehicle alongside the traction drive? Absolutely, absolutely. This is where the circuit carbide and GAN, uh, the lower power devices, will be uh, also benefiting the overall system efficiency, uh, not only electrical system efficiency, but also the thermal in size. As you mentioned, if you design it to run 
at a higher frequency uh, by the use of this wide band gap material, sodium carbide and GAN, uh, now you're able to reduce your LNC components, your inductors and, and uh, capacitors. And that allows you to compact uh, the design significantly uh, and uh, reducing the space that you're using for those devices. So we're seeing that uh, in, in, in the trend as well. And we're also seeing the, um, the increasing power in, in, in those devices. And when I say those devices, there's the... Uh, Ombo chargers and the DCDC. We are now seeing uh, Ombo chargers uh, into the level four area, which is uh, exceeding the uh, 20 kilowatt range. So now it makes it even more appealing to to go into the wideband gap solutions. Yeah, uh, it's very interesting. Just just to actually circle back to one thing that I forgot to ask earlier. You mentioned 48 volts. Um, kind of mild hybrids when we first started talking. What does ON do for uh, 48 volt components? I'm, I'm assuming we're not using silicon carbide um, down at that kind of level. Yeah, so 48 volts is actually a very interesting area because we see it as uh, augmenting the market or helping transition a- into uh, a full electric, uh, electric vehicle. Um, and 48 volt uh, basically can be implemented on today's technology, uh, today's internal combustion engine technology, with an immediate um, numbers uh, we've seen as high as 15% benefit on existing solution um, by changing uh, the uh, starter generator into a 40 volt system, for example, and then additional components that you move into a 40 volt system. So what ON has done is creating a, a a base technology for this 40 volt system and multiple solutions were now in production with multiple applications uh, in you know global uh, automotive market um, with uh, discrete solutions as well as modules for this 40 uh, volt applications. We're seeing also increased power levels at uh, this 40 volt systems uh, for uh, bigger vehicles that require uh, 25 kilowatts. Um, integrated starter generator, for example, and we do have that solution with our latest uh, APM automotive power module solution with 100 volt uh, and 80 volt modules. And what kind of switching technology is in those devices? Those are uh, pure uh, silicon MOSFETs. Uh, So we've decided uh, optimizing the MOSFETs, the silicon MOSFETs for those applications would be uh, sufficient. Okay. Uh, Really interesting. It's, it's, um, It's certainly an area that we see a lot of potential in as well in um, a, a, across a range of applications. So it's a, interesting that level of diversity in in the market um, right now, and and really interesting that you guys are operating across the whole thing. It, does that create any challenges in terms of things like capacity? So we often uh, well we we hear pre the. <laughs> Pre everyone stopping work and going home to hide from this horrible virus, um, you know, people were hitting issues with battery capacity, um, DC link capacitor supply, short supply. I mean, opto isolators, switching. You know, you name it. There's supply chain shortages of lots and lots of things that are, are required to build electric vehicles at at the moment. How is how is the capacity uh, on? And is, is there you know, the fact that you do operate across such a, a wide range, um, does that create its own challenges? That's a very, very good question. And that's a very key question. Um, you know, we talk about technology. Having the right technology is one thing. Having the, the breadth of technology is one thing. But um, we at Anthony, especially uh, with our history, we are um, a big uh, supplier for the automotive market, uh, for the worldwide silicon carbide, uh, silicon uh, market as well yeah but without preparing enough capacity for these technologies uh, it would definitely be a problem so one of the things that uh, we've done is we've uh, added another uh, manufacturing site for uh, power devices specifically and adding a few more other uh, bcd technologies into our new 12 inch fab in new york and this is going to be our 13th fab so we already have 12 uh, fabs uh, providing us uh, the 80 billion units that we're shipping today to the, the global market and adding this whoa, whoa. additional how many 
So we have 12 fabs worldwide. Yeah. Um, and and I, I, this would be our 13th fab. And you said you shipped, was that 80 billion? Yes. Last year, uh, is eight zero. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's a lot of switching devices. <laughs> 80 billion units that we ship. This is why, I mean, uh, as uh, a, a major contributor to the uh, semiconductor market. Yeah. yeah, yeah, kind of. You could say that. <laughs> so so what's the capacity of the new fab that you guys are bringing? And, and you said that was in New York, as in New York State, I guess. This is actually, um, it's a place called Fishkill, New York. Um, and uh, New York, as you may know, is a pretty big state. But yeah, uh, this was uh, a fab uh, that we purchased towards the end of last year, and we will have it up and running uh, in in less than twelve months now. And uh, this is where uh, this is going to be the largest fab of all the fabs that we have. Oh, and wow. what you have to do in power is you have to basically ship more devices with more semiconductors um, because power, you could not gain from, uh, you know, shrinking technologies. So power is power. Yeah. Uh, more power means more devices. And for that, you need more capacity. So yeah. this is one of the reasons that we went out and uh, got this big, big <laughs> uh, fab. When you put it like that, it's kind of it seems really obvious. But you know what? I I never really thought about it that way before. That obviously in normal, in normal devices, um, you know, mic- microchips and and whatnot. Obviously, they they get more, they get more for for the wafer, you know, as 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 tech shrinks. But for power, you wouldn't. Uh, so then, the, I mean, the capacity in this new facility must be absolutely massive. Then, if you if it's your biggest one yet, yes. Yeah, this uh, the way we have it designed um, is it will ramp up uh, slowly uh, as you add more and more devices, and it's perfect because uh, the market will also grow. Um, you know, not instantly, but uh, also slowly. So. We will be able to ramp up uh, to a significant size of production uh, when it it is fully up and running uh, in early 2022. But uh, it will provide us a very solid supply structure for the uh, explosive EV market that we're expecting. Wow. So I'm guessing that's several millions of vehicles worth of uh, switching devices per year, potentially. Correct. Correct. There's a lot of consumption of those power devices in each electric vehicle. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, so again, one, one of the other, I guess, sort of myths in the semi world is that, um, you know, it's the, the, the basically Asia is where it's all happening. And if I actually had someone say to me, if you were going to build a new fab, you know, you, you, you would build it in Asia, you wouldn't, you wouldn't choose to build it somewhere else. But then Interestingly, you guys have made a really strong commitment there to American manufacturing with a with a huge investment um, in uh, in in New York State. Um, so, is, is there a, a specific driver for that? I mean, is it um, are, are you kind of making some some sort of sacrifices, or, or do you, do you just feel like you know the U.S. is the best place to do that? No, actually, we you know being a global um, company, our customers all globally are located uh, in our our fabs. The other fabs that we have are in Asia. So uh, this choice was uh, purely from a standpoint of having the right uh, uh, the right uh, fab uh, with uh, you know the right time. Uh, this fab was perfectly um, situated for us in terms of timing and acquisition uh, so the decision factor is more in line with having a fab with the you know the right value the right time as opposed to a location our fabs are located um, some of them uh, in Asia some of them in Europe uh, now uh, some of them in the US so this is uh, really to serve the global market and it, uh, is it possible to make um all of the devices in one fab, or do you have to split them off into different uh, locations? Yeah, and you can imagine uh, shipping this many billion devices. Uh, the logistics uh, of this is, is very difficult. But at the same time, uh, where you put your technology 
really depends on a lot of different things. Uh, but one thing you gain out of this is having, you know, 12, 13 fabs uh, is the ability to have multiple technologies and multiple fabs. Yeah. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, towards the beginning of our conversation, having that business continuity with that um, capability. But at the same time, there is something that specifically in automotive that is required. In automotive, you're required to have one source for one device at any given time. So you, we can only ship one device from one fab um, mm. unless there is an acceptance from the end customer. So that's defined by the automotive process, uh, the PPAP and AEC qualifications. Right. And and from a technology, like a manufacturing technology point of view, are you able to make you know silicon carbide devices and pure silicon MOSFETs in the same location, or you know, can you do you have, can you produce GAN devices in the same location, or are there some technology differences that uh, mean that you have to have different uh, manufacturing locations? And I'll answer this in general terms. Uh, there is nothing that stops you from from making those devices in the same location, um, and uh, and there's also uh, the potential to have. A sense of excellence uh, based on the people and the material, the materials that are used, the, the machines, uh, everything surrounding uh, those wide band gap solutions versus silicon, uh, those are not necessarily the same. Um, so in some cases, it, it warrants to have a center of excellence for a certain application somewhere, but there is nothing that stops you from having one plant, um, you know, providing multiple different technologies. We do it all the time. All oh, right, oh, fantastic. That's a huge amount of uh, flexibility built uh, built right into the system there. Brilliant. Um, so then, you know, lo- looking forwards into the future, what what are you most excited about coming uh, coming down the pipeline in t- in terms of uh, new technology, um, new applications, new devices? What's the thing that's get- getting you most excited? Yeah. So. It really is. Um, I'm very, very much excited about uh, where we are as a company and the commitments that we have from our senior management and the and board of directors and and the relationships that we have with our customers. And that really translates into understanding what the market needs and the innovation, the people that we have in our organization. It's fantastic people that we have in the innovation in the current production. And then being able to optimize it to uh, have the right product ready at the right time and the supply chain that we're putting behind it so that we can provide without being dependent on um, uh, as much outside factors as possible. So for us, the customers understanding their needs, understanding their challenges in the world, and then our people providing uh, the solutions and then having the right uh, supply uh, strategy and and then being ready for the market. That's really the exciting part. And specifically in the power semiconductor area, you know, be on the lookout for our next generation IGBT modules, uh, our exciting silicon carbide uh, solutions, including uh, a very stable uh, supply chain for the silicon carbide as well. As yeah. you know, it's not uh, fully materialized yet in terms of you know who's getting what supply from um, uh, from where on yeah. the silicon carbide, but On is putting together a very stable supply chain there uh, while cranking out the technology, and then adding additional technologies, the gallium nitride, and the innovation surrounding those uh, solutions. Yeah, and it, do, do you see um, kind of any adjacent markets popping up? So we 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 often talk about the electrification of everything, you know, so. There's all sorts of uh, interesting projects happening with aircraft, aerospace, shipping, you know, kind of renewables and that kind of thing. Do you do you see much going on there in in the adjacent fields, or really is is the main focus uh, autom- automotive? The, the, there's always those additional incremental areas, but really the two that we see, especially that go hand in hand are the industrial and the automotive, uh, the industrialization of uh, some of the, uh, whether it is manufacturing um, uh, locations or um, the charging infrastructure, for example, mm-hmm. the renewable energies uh, and uh, motor efficiencies. 
we see those as a very good uh, tangential business between automotive and industrial. Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I, I've got one last question, actually, um, which I probably should have started with at the beginning, but uh, that's the, the, the sort of course for these things. What does, um, where did the company name come from and what, what does it mean on Semiconductor? <laughs> this, is, uh, this, is, this is a challenging question. I'm glad that you're asking this last as opposed to first because <laughs> I, I don't have the full story, but I've heard many different stories okay. about the name of it. As you know, the company spun off from Motorola in 1999, uh, and uh, apparently the name uh, starts around that area and maybe slightly before, but I do not have the full story. And um, <laughs> I think I'll have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> okay, no, it's fascinating. Uh, so interesting, and the, I mean the the name and the uh, and the branding and things are really strong. But I wonder if it's uh, like someone's initials or it's it's got to there's got to be some kind of interesting uh, tale behind that in terms of um, unless it's just you you, it's, you know you're switching the world on or something along those lines. I'm not sure, but uh, oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard I've heard many different stories about buttons and uh, you know, but I really <laughs> I think I'll have to go and settle this with uh, some of the people that have all the history. But this oh. is an interesting one. Well, when you find out, do let me know because that's the kind of thing which uh, that'll keep me awake at night until uh, and, and, until I can uh, scratch <laughs> the itch in my brain. Okay, uh, so great. We'll make sure that we'll reach out to you. Yep. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk to me today, Deres. Uh, it's been really, it's been really interesting that that kind of trot through um, what On is doing in the in the the power switching device field. I think um, you know it's, it's it's a company name that I'd heard of a little bit before, but not. I had no idea. You know, there's 80 billion devices a year. I mean, that's just absolutely um, astounding and uh, really great to see you guys positioning yourselves in the market with um with manufacturing in north america as well so thank you so much for taking the time out to to talk to me today thank you ryan i appreciate it as well uh, thanks uh, to you and uh avid learning i'll be uh looking out for more pods uh on this network as well and i uh i look forward to talking to you soon again so that's all we've got time for today uh i hope you found that useful um, like I said before, and, and I think a little apology actually, because we've been a bit quiet on the podcast channel uh, for the first part of this year. So we're going to use the time um, well on on this uh, work from home period whilst the world sorts itself out uh, from all the uh, crazy stuff that's going on. So there's a number of podcasts coming uh, from Avid, which will be coming back to the, the channel. So make sure you subscribe um, or, uh, or or follow us. Please, uh, you know, share these with people. Uh, we've noticed the viewing figures have gone through the roof um, on our videos and, and listens on the podcast. I guess people stuck at home uh, wanting to kind of add some value. Um, so, you know, share this with people. If you found it useful, they might too. Uh, I look forward to speaking to you again soon.